welcome back to the last vlog. This next talk is by two people, Malte Sandstede and Nicolas Göbel. And the talk is called Across Time and Space Building Explorative UIs Using <laughs> Many Words Interpretation of State sorry, and, sorry. and Change <laughs> in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, yeah, they're both researchers at ETH Zürich and uh, work at a company called Clockworks. So give a Thank round you. of applause. the title, thank you all for coming. This is Across Time and Space, etc. etc. So as you might have figured out, we are here to talk about time to you. Uh, and we kind of want to throw some use cases that many of you might have encountered in one form or another that might not seem related at first. So we have things like we want to look at the edit history of users in our app. We want to provide things like an undo and redo functionality. We want to have multiple users collaborating within our app working on, on the same data sets. We want to, this is kind of a different space, we kind of want to work with data sources that don't really agree on the same notion of time. So we have maybe sensor networks uh, with timestamps from different time zones, all these things. Uh, and we kind of want to do speculative things. We don't want to immediately have to commit to a transaction when working with the system. We kind of want to ask, like, what would the state of the system be, assuming I were to do this? And finally, especially in the collaborative use uh, yeah, scenario, once we start uh, making collaborative changes, we might become in conflict. We might start violating some constraints of the domain. In that setting, we don't want our applications to just like throw in the towel and just give up. Instead, we kind of want to work and uh, help the users uh, resolve these conflicts. So what all of these use cases kind of share, we will argue, is that they're uh, concerned with time. <coughs> and so it will be our question, or like our question was, how can we model different time semantics uh, and how can we implement those efficiently? Like to give an analogy, we've heard even today, we've heard many talks uh, that explore these common abstractions that we have for working with data. So things like map and reduce, and even more than that, how we can exploit the structure that is inherent in them uh, for benefits. For example, for um, parallel execution of code. We know things like, oh, a map has more concurrent, uh, more opportunities for concurrency than something like a left fold. Uh, and we kind of want to take these same ways of finding common abstractions uh, for the time aspect of things. And finally, while the overarching uh, topic here is kind of a data modeling uh, concern, we will be stealing from uh, stream processing, from the field of stream processing, to make these things uh, run efficiently. And we are kind of looking at all of these things through the lens of front-end state management. So for state that is actually supposed to be rendered somewhere to be uh, used in a browser. But this is like a subset of a much more general space. So my name is Nicolas Goebel. This is my esteemed colleague, Malte Zanstede. We work together at this small consultancy called Clockworks. Uh, and we also, by now, Malte used to be at TU Munich. Now we're both at ETH Zurich. And we do research <coughs> on uh, novel approaches to stream processing that kind of intersect with what we're uh, going to talk about today. And we're working under the supervision of Frank McSherry. Uh, who is kind of the originator of many of the ideas uh, that will be touched upon in here. Cool. So let's get some definitions out of the way. Whenever uh, we're talking about um, state in this presentation, I don't know if you've seen the prologue talk before, but this is kind of similar. We will be breaking down state into uh, facts, uh, and facts are triples of entities, attributes, and value, where an entity is something like a person or a to-do item or a bank account, and entities can be associated with attributes, age, the done status, uh, a reference to an owner, and values are any kind of primitive type or references, and these taken together form these triplets, uh, entity attribute value. Uh, this is what we will be considering as a fact. And we will be gathering these facts into sets, and this is what we will call state. So here we describe a state where some menu is open, we are working with a user called test user, and there is a to-do on the screen that has a due date and a, and a status. Now the interesting thing is, uh, whenever we consider this notion of time, what, that, uh, what does that even mean? Uh, we will be talking about time as imposing various orderings on a sequence of states throughout our application. So if we find a way to talk about the ordering between states, we will have found a model to talk about time in that scenario. So we'll just start and talk about some of these orders, and the easiest order maybe is no order at all. So we have no time in our definition, but we have space or state that is smeared around the system. And if you've done some front-end development, 
you maybe know the, this from the dark ages because it's kind of horrible when you try to scale an application. We built a very simple to-do app to the top. Uh, you can delete something and then there is some loading screen, deleting, deleting, deleting. And afterwards, um, the to-do is deleted, but the counter of all your to-dos stays the same. And this is also the issue we face when we don't have any concept of time because we are basically in the Wild West. Every component for themselves. We store the state, which how many to-dos we have separately from the state of each to-do. So in this case, it would be the DOM, for example. So we denote this as uh, just a set of entities, attributes, and values without any time at all. Um, and we don't really have a single source of truth. So let's quickly move on. In the theory, of course, you could do this consistently, but in practice, it's really hard. And let's look at something that will help us with that, which is epochal snapshots. Um, and if you're somewhat into front-end development, you will know this from patterns like Redux, from the Elm language. If you're more on the closure side of things or the back-end side of things, you might know Datomic, which puts this idea of database as a value first. Um, and if you're a functional programmer, you know this as well. Because now, when we transition from one uh, state to the other, from T0 to T2, this is actually applying a function. We have this state at the, central, uh, at the center of our system. We apply a transaction, and we get a new state. And this is like a flip book. We can just flip through this. And we denote this with a set of triples plus a time for each triple. And this is pretty cool, since now we can start moving through it. With that out of the way, we can now define what we think is a snapshot, which is basically a database at some time t star. And for that, we consider the sum of all facts that happened before this t star, denoted by this less equals relation. And just for now, we don't consider retractions. Um, so every fact stays uh, true for the whole runtime of our system. Later, this might change. That allows us to do quite cool things. We can now start and time travel, at least along one dimension. Basically, that's mostly undo and redo, but this actually does. Uh, because we can now move from T0 to T1 to T2, and if we decide we want to go back, we can go back. But when we now do something else, we still are in the same timeline, so our, our rights are destructive. We destroy the old timeline um, and fork off it. Or, yeah. Um, this is one problem, but another more pressing matter, maybe, is that we have this all or nothing problem. So, for example, if we take our to do app again, and we go through this process and we undo a step because we can't differentiate between what comes from the user and what is kind of from the system, we have to see this deleting spinner once again when we undo. So we can't decide, let's jump from here, one step back, but skip this one, so we land there and then go forward again. But we always have to move through all these various steps. So how can we solve this? So if, if any of you have kind of entered this, this world through any of the angles that Malte mentioned, then you've probably run into this. Like many, we, we are closure people. Uh, we know many people come to Datomic and they hear, oh, this is the time traveling database. And they try this and they immediately run into a problem like that. And they're like, oh, this sucks. Now, why, why, why does this work in this weird way? And so we kind of have to extend the semantics of time that we're considering here, uh, which leads to something called bitemporal modeling. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's a, it's a, a common, common thing in databases. And the basic idea is we will separate um, our uh, facts in, along uh, two distinct timelines. So the one we will call the system time and one we will call the event time or the user time. Um, and uh, we, we will um, enforce, this is not like, this is a thing that we decide that system, uh, first of all, system time progress is independent of the event time. And also system time can never be re rebound. Like system time always goes forward. And so this is represented in our model here uh, in that we move from the <coughs> scalar timestamps from before, uh, we move to pairs of timestamps. So every single fact 
carries a pair of timestamp indicating the moment it became true in system time and the moment it became true along the event time axis. And kind of the representation in our example before is that now this weird intermediate state that is kind of automatically triggered by a timer, by an animation, by a web request, this is kind of along the system axis and the actual intent of the user moving from I had three to-dos to now I have two to-dos uh, that is entirely on a separate uh, timeline and merging these two together we get the full view of our application but uh, within the model they are separated and this if we revisit the time traveling approach in this uh, enhanced model uh, what we get is as I said we scrub along the event time and ignore the system time still our writes along the event uh, timeline will be destructive so if I go back and change something that will rewrite event time but the all or nothing problem is solved because if I undo, I will only undo the, the thing that the user actually caused. So this will feel natural uh, to, to the user. And of course, we can generalize this uh, towards uh, multi-temporal snapshots, so why stop at two? Maybe we have a system uh, where we need to distinguish not two sources of, uh, of events, so the user and the system, but an arbitrary number of, uh, of sources. So for example, we are receiving events from a server. Uh, we're uh, working with multiple users within an app and if I hit undo on an app I don't want to undo the changes uh, from someone else working there I want to undo my own changes so uh, if we extend this timestamp to be not just a pair but a vector uh, of n coordinates we can distinguish between n different sources of input so let's just recap for a moment we have now looked at some differing timestamp semantics and these always result in a different semantic for what we denote here as star and this dot. So um, a snapshot in the easiest case where we don't have any times, there this doesn't really exist. Uh, when we look at epochal snapshots, we just look at a t that is small, less or equal to a t star. Um, with system and event times, we get bidimensional, uh, bi and here we are multi dimension. But what we didn't look at uh, yet is the relation in which these are. Especially if these happen before less equal relation. Because when we look at one dimensional timestamps, we're actually talking about the total order. And when we're talking about uh, the bidimensional and multidimensional timestamps, that is partial orders. So just to explain this a little bit more, this is actually quite straightforward. So we have a total order, uh, as you know and love it. So if is zero less or equal than zero, yes. Zero less or equal than, than two, yes. Is one less or equal than zero, no. And we always have this, we can say it like it happened before. So this is just a little bit of distributed systems. Zero happened before zero is still true. And as we saw, this then allows us to see what kind of stuff happened in our systems step by step, but it coalesces differing event sources into one where we can't tell which one is which. Now we move on to partial orders, where we define our happened before as a product partial order. So in this time, in this setting, we have two dimensional. Uh, timestamps and they are less or equal when both coordinates for themselves are less or equal uh, to another. So to, to compare 2 and 5 and 7 and 9, we compare 2 with 7 and 5 and 9 and this holds. But when we compare 2 and 1 and 5 and 9, 2 and 1 doesn't hold so these are not partially ordered. and very importantly, the other way around as well, which means we don't have an order here at all. And lastly, this of course scales out, so even if we have 1000 and 0, if we compare it to 0 and 1, not partially ordered. And now we can put this a little into perspective for bitemporal uh, timelines. When we have this notion of now, uh, then we will only consider these facts because we will consider the sum of facts where all the times are less or equal to now, so before now, with regards to our product partial order, so happened before. And we can also talk about the space 
that is around this. This is a little bit gray. Uh, and we can examine this even further by looking into it and saying we disregard these facts. First, we disregard facts due to close times because we told you we consider system time as only moving forwards. So when we define our now as here, we can't move along the x-axis back again. And secondly, we disregard some facts because these simply lie in the future. We could still reach them, but as of this now, we don't consider them, but only this area that sums up to what we know here about our system. And this, finally, when examining this further, allows us to scrub along the event axis. This is the selective time travel where we say we don't want to consider uh, system time changes, so we move now down here, the area gets smaller, and we consider less facts. So, in summary, this allows us to enable a more fine-grained separation, and what this doesn't solve, but what we want to cover now is what we do about destructive rights. Right, so we've seen this before. Why do we even care about this uh, destructive rights stuff? Whenever, for all of the cases that we looked at before, it was always about modifying the past and trying something else instead. But there is often the case that not only are we interested in the past, but also we want to consider many possible options for the future, like for these kind of speculative uh, use cases, or we need to hold more than a single version of our state uh, at, a, at the same logical point in time. For example, if we have a, a conflict, uh, we make conflicting edits in a collaborative uh, application, we will arrive at the logical point in time at which two different things are true that can't be true at the same time, but still our app kind of has to uh, deal with those. So to, so, uh, to support these uh, existing use, uh, more, more complex use cases, we kind of have to move to something that is akin to moving from the functional paradigm to something like the relational paradigm. Again, if you've been to the, to the prolog talk, um, here the notion changes from we have a state and we apply a function and we arrive at a resulting state to uh, we have a set of constraints where we give some inputs and then we consider a set of states that are valid given, uh, given these constraints. So we move from a single resulting state at any point in time to a set um, of uh, possible um, states at the same point in time. And we call this the n-dimensional um, model. So we move from the n-temporal to the n-dimensional. And you might be asking, like, what? We, we already have these pairs. Why can't we just reuse them for this? Like, we had the fork before, but here this is like PowerPoint. You don't have to actually do the dotted lines there. You can use. The, the, the actual um, draw, draw the line uh, like this one, and we can call this zero, and we call this one, and so now, haha, we have two uh, states at the same logical point in time, we just separate them by this index, um, basically. But the problem here is that given the partial order that Mata just explained, uh, we are violating something, because the state two zero, given the same product partial order, uh, is happened before the state two one, so suddenly, um, our uh, universes that were supposed to be separate, they kind of leak into each other. And that is not the kind of semantics that we wanted. Uh, so versions, different versions, even though they exist at the same point in time, they should be isolated from each other. But here, um, this was violated. So now, we do the same trick modeling-wise. We just add a new coordinate. We call this eta to kind of distinguish here, uh, to indicate the version. but we change the, uh, we have to change the order. So instead of doing what we just did before, we extend this order, this partial order from the bitemporal model, we extend it by this simple additional constraint which says we will only consider facts to happen before each other um, when uh, they are actually in the same version. So this kind of maybe looks fancy, but it's this, just the same thing with another clause. Hey, uh, we, are, we want to keep these multiple versions isolated from each other. And um, we can kind of try and make this a bit more uh, graspable. Yeah. So when we prepared our talk, we of course created a Gantt chart to track our time with various work packages. And we have some kind of time unit that is not really important here. But what is important is today, since this is our deadline and the day we give our talk. And of course, when you make plans, can be sure that they don't match up. So at some point, our second green task 
moved from five to 10 time units. And now we face an issue, right? Because we kind of have to fit this into our existing plan. And there are two ways of doing this, or two obvious ways of doing it. The first thing is because we give this talk together, maybe we can parallelize. So then we have a possible conflict here if this is not parallelizable, but maybe this works. Another way of doing it would be to say, well, let's talk to Bobcon. Maybe we can just move the deadline a little bit. So we keep this here and we just have to move the deadline. This might not be feasible. It might be the system doesn't know this. And this is also what makes this interesting because in, in normal systems that don't have this notion of multidimensionality, there are two ways of dealing with this. The first one is we just get an error state. You can't do this, you will, you will miss your deadline. Or the system decides for you. But the way we propose to do it is that the user is actually asked. So the user can decide and makes an explicit choice about what he wants, which universe he picks, or he can, or he can run with both. So the idea is we have multiple valid universes, and we can start and play with, around with them. And this is a really easy example here. In this case, you could just calculate this uh, or, or do it as like a small visualization exercise. But this scales out to more complicated systems, to complete simulations, or what if questions you ask, where you want to run along with it and keep separate but equally valid um, states of the system at hand that don't affect each other. Nice. So to, put, to tie this back together in a sense, uh, obviously you might have noticed there are applications out there that have undo and redo functionality. There are applications out there that allow for collaboration. Uh, the point is not to say that this is impossible to do otherwise. The point is to find common abstractions. But kind of the, 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 the nice thing about a common abstraction is if it kind of buys us something from the implementation standpoint, right? So we kind of, it's nice to say this like, oh yeah, we have all these snapshots lying around, we have all these versions uh, in here, but is this actually feasible? Can we like uh, render separate, um, separate versions of our app on the same time? Can we hold all this state in memory? All of these points like is where the, the common abstraction should actually buy us uh, something nice for our implementation side and this is kind of where we switch where we've seen like a bunch of valid time semantics and we kind of have to change a bit um, uh, our programming paradigm to, to think about like how can we actually make this possible and we kind of want to introduce uh, a paradigm called differential programming um, and the reason for that is obviously we cannot copy state all the time like if, if I split the state into two possible states I cannot do a full copy of the database all the time if you've ever used like a functional data structure, persistent data structure, this is obvious to you. And at the same time, if I consider many different snapshots at the same time, for example, I'm looking at the whole history of my application, or I'm looking at various possibilities at the current state, I don't want to recompute everything from scratch all of the time for each of, uh, for, for all of these universes. And so for the first part, like, Getting, getting rid of all these, uh, these copies, we kind of have to rectify the omission from, from earlier where we never talked about like what does it actually mean uh, to retract the fact from a snapshot such that we can arrive at the notion of differences or deltas between these snapshots. So again, if you've known, uh, uh, if you know something about how persistent data structures are implemented, this might also seem familiar. Here, we want to represent, for, for each fact, uh, we also um, store a multiplicity, so just a number in this case, and where we represent adding this fact into our database by a plus one and retracting this fact from our database again by a minus one. And this gives us a way to talk about the difference between snapshots by just specifying the delta. So when we go from state zero to state one, one of the difference here is that we're showing this uh, intermittent menu, so we don't have to store the full copy, we only have to store the delta with respect uh, to the previous snapshot, and the same thing when going from snapshot uh, state one to state two. And because of these multiplicities, like if we add these things together, we kind of don't have a set of things anymore, a set of facts, but rather a bag or a multi-set, so we, we can have more than one of the same fact, or, yeah. And uh, so this solves the first problem, uh, where we kind of said it's not feasible to store full copies, so we say like store the base version and store deltas instead. Makes sense, I think. 
But now the thing is, whenever we work in a functional language, we usually, at the, mo at the point in time where we start computing with our persistent data structures, we treat them as snapshots again. And what this looks like, I think, I hope it's also pretty obvious, where we say we have this database collection at some point in time, time zero, we apply a function to it, and we arrive at a results collection at that same point in time. And this function can be anything, it can be evaluating a query, looking up a value in a hash map, but also like computing the page rank over some graph, uh, doing interesting things um, that we can express as functions. And we kind of have to move this way of working with snapshots to something that many of you might have heard of, which is called incremental computation, uh, where we consider a kind of modified version of these functions, we call it delta f in this case, that still starts at some database state zero, but then only considers uh, the user change. So for example, the user uh, inputted some new data or retracted a fact, and this will be considered as a second argument, and what will be produced is the output diff that if applied to the previously computed result, will update the result to match this new reality. And this allows us uh, to reuse the previous results uh, to speed up our computation. So we don't always have to recompute everything from scratch, but instead we can reuse. So this is like a kind of generalized version of something like dynamic programming uh, or caching. And now obviously the next question is how do we actually find this weird uh, delta incrementalized uh, version of a function? And this is where we kind of touch on, on the research field that we're working in uh, and a system called differential data flow uh, it's available on GitHub, you can check it out later. What it does, it's an incrementalized computational framework, which means you express your computations in the same functional way that, that you're used to, using maps, filters, reduces, uh, relational joins, um, iterations, and uh, it will uh, express implement those functions as automatically incrementalized data flow computations. And the data flow part of that could be a whole other talk, but what it buys you is basically it is, um, out of the box, it is data parallel and distributable. So it doesn't matter whether you run it on a laptop or you run it uh, across a cluster of uh, a, cr a cluster of devices. Uh, the point is that you don't have to think about this incrementalized version of your computations. Rather, you can work in the same functional world that we are all used to and get the incrementalization kind of for free. And an additional kind of like teaser regarding all of the stuff that was mentioned, for example, today in the keynote. We can use the same partial orders to kind of exploit uh, fine-grained concurrency uh, between, our, um, between our data. So for example, everything that is not ordered by the partial order can be computed in parallel because we know it can't affect each other. And so this is why it's so crucial to express these things correctly. If we look at different versions of our, of our state, if we get the ordering right and our system supports it, and differential data flow is a system that supports this, uh, then we can actually be much more efficient in what we can compute at the same time. So this might be interesting coming from more of the type system approach to exploiting parallelism uh, and towards more of a data-driven kind of, even math-driven approach to like using these partial orders, not just for fine-grained uh, visibility from the implementation side, but also from, uh, from the concurrency side. And so yeah, this is differential data flow. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, it is it's written in Rust. Uh, that is, uh, um, this is, for example, a breadth-first search implemented in, in differential data flow. So you use like maps and this iteration operator, and use a relational join and a union and a, a grouping function. And the interesting thing is, once you compile this program uh, and run it, you can change the edges and the nodes collections arbitrarily. So adding edges, removing edges, adding nodes, removing nodes, and the whole computation will update incrementally across potentially clusters, so for very large graphs uh, and all of that, and it uh, runs very fast and is very nice. And it gives us a way to not just express, storage-wise express our snapshots in divs, but also use these divs when we actually compute some interesting things on these snapshots. Okay, so we talked about time, we explored different time semantics, <coughs> we looked at uh, the epochal time model that is kind of the functional time model uh, which kind of buys us basic sanity because like if any of you remember how web development worked before something like uh, React and Redux came along then you know why and uh, we explored uh, slightly more complex models like the multi-temporal model to implement these uh, fine-grained undo and redo capabilities between different sources. Oh, 
and uh, yeah, and these more complex models. And we looked at ways of implementing those efficiently using this diff-based approach, not just in storage, but also in computation using the magic of differential data flow. And thank you very much for your time. So if you have questions, <laughs> we can talk like I can. <laughs> yeah, let's start with some questions. We can expand. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I did not fully understand why you store all of the timestamps instead of just a union uh, or some type of just one timestamp on which time axis this operates. For example, all the events could also say that here uh, the only timeline I care about is the system timeline because it's a system event. Yes, so you mean you would uh, add a new type kind of in the timestamp that says this is a system type and just indicate the, so you just store one coordinate in there? Yeah, you only store one time there. It's the, that's kind of the difference in approach. Like some, at some point in time, we, we need this information at runtime, right? So uh, at some point we have to store something additional in the data. So whether we kind of keep track of what the type of this timestamp is supposed to be, uh, that would be a uh, possibility, but it's not an optimization space-wise because we need to know at runtime uh, how these things work. Uh, so it would more be that why do you store all of the times instead of just one for an event? Because we need to know at runtime where in time this event happened. Yeah, but you only need to store one. Uh, like my question is, do you actually need to store all the time and all the time axis for this specific event, or is it enough to store one time? If, so you only store it for whenever an event happens, you record the time at which it happened, right? Yeah, exactly, but you only store one at the time on one time axis. No, not necessarily, because this is like, yeah, okay, this is an interesting question because it kind of, well, if I, if I, how can I go back here? So if you, can, uh, if you look at the separation uh, here, this is a simple case where, we, where we're very clear on that, um, what the system is actually showing uh, uh, is um, clearly separated from what the user did, but there might be cases where we want actually at some point, once the user undoes a, a, a number of steps, there is something that the system did automatically, like changing the screen in our app, like routing something, which not just affects the system time, but also affects the user time. And so whenever something like that happens, we need to record for this event, not just a position along system time, but also a position along um, the uh, event time. And from the implementation standpoint, uh, if you do something like an iterative computation on a graph in the distributed setting, we use these timestamp coordinates to track like the, the loop iteration, the loop counter. Uh, and so in that setting, uh, it is, uh, you don't always have zero in the other coordinates if that kind of is what you meant. So we need to store them for all of them. Okay. Yes? I'm a little bit curious about how uh, the sort of like the differential calculation to actually implement this something like automatic differentiation on the, on the computation? Or Not in the machine learning sense, no. Uh, so, it's, no, it, it is kind of uh, a set of, uh, of operators that are thought through to implement, uh, to, to work with this diff based approach. So, if you were to sit down with a piece of paper and think about like how would a relational join work in the incrementalized case? You could kind of, at least in the in a sequential operation, you could kind of come up with it, right? You mean like, okay, I need the index of this relation, I need the index here, I keep some things in cache. And this gets a bit harder if you consider the distributed case where inputs can be out of order and we can have things happening in parallel, we need to resh reshuffle data, but basically it's tractable. The thing is you, you just don't want to do it every time you have to like describe your computation. And so basically this is where uh, the fine people around like Frank McSherry and, and uh, others have kind of written this, these, these implementations for you. So it's not magic in that sense, it's just annoying and very hard to do correctly by yourself. And, sorry, let me ask another yeah, question. Yeah. Um, and so what sort of guarantees or even like sort of um, practical indications you have about the sort of, you know, it, you, can calculate it, you can calculate the sort of uh, diff in the output that a diff in the input would help cause yes. and apply that to the, to the existing output, yes. or you could recalculate from scratch. What sort of um, 
What's your performance characteristics? Can you right. expect from the difference? So, so uh, in, in general, like the, the, the sweet spot for computations on, for this is anything that looks like a graph, because usually with a graph, you have a big graph, and the changes might be high frequency, but the changes in themselves are rather small. Like there, you take away some edges, you add some edges, add some nodes. Uh, and so in these cases where the difference between states is at least like an order of magnitude smaller than your actual data set, it kind of makes sense to think about incremental computation in general. Uh, and if you have anything that looks like that, then I'm pretty sure that differential data flow is like kind of the, the, the most efficient system out there that you can get for these kinds of uh, computations. For something numerical where I multiply some matrices and the output has basically like nothing to do in terms of descriptive power to the input, it doesn't really like have the same impact because we don't gain anything from just looking at the, at the differences. Any more questions? Yes. Um, my read is a bit rust, but you have this, what is it, delta f, I guess, you get. Yes, yes. Uh, all these things serialized? Mm, yeah, no. The, so in principle, no, because the point of the data flow computation is that you know the structure of the computation statically. So you can get dynamic elements, but via the data plane, not via the structure of the computation. So if you know I have to compute like a breadth first search here, then you can construct all the channels and uh, get the, the operators connected. Uh, but the, this is not something that you send over the wire. Or did you mean serializable in the consistency sense? No. Okay. Yes. How much time do we have left? Really not. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there are more questions, then uh, we have plenty of time, I think. What, what did I get wrong? I thought we I were until 17. I think we just. Okay. Just spoke very fast. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, no, yeah. there's. Uh, All right, so. Like there are no questions. different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, in the back. Maybe, maybe you can uh, talk a few minutes about uh, where you use it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, so the um, this comes from the backend, right? So this is kind of where uh, right now you might be using something like Spark, or you use a setup with Kafka and some screen processors on top of that. Uh, anything where you are computing uh, some analytics on top of a graph that is changing uh, in, in a like high, high frequency way. And so we've used this kind of to implement, for example, a, a data log engine on top of that, where you just stream through uh, anything you would normally pipe into a database, and you get like an interactive uh, query engine on top uh, that works completely reactively out of the box. So I, I ask a query, and whenever it is affected by new data in the system, I will get uh, as I will get outputs there. Uh, we build all kinds of like graph computations, uh, like stream processing jobs, and on the so the whole thing, um, as I said, it uh, because of the data flow nature, it doesn't matter whether you run it kind of on a single thread or whether you run it on a cluster. So we've compiled this thing down into kind of web assembly and just use it in the browser as the same kind of thing really, like as a database almost. So you, where you, if, if some of you are familiar with this uh, functional uh, reactive programming paradigm, uh, where you think in terms of streams and observables, we kind of do the same thing there. We say uh, we input data at one end, we ask queries on the other end, and uh, the queries are updated reactively, and this determines the rendering in our application. And so we get, uh, f for these time semantics, it literally is, it doesn't require any change to the, to the core of the system. It just means if you modify your inputs to have uh, different timestamps, uh, and you uh, then you your outputs will um, will uh, con confirm to this to these partial orders, and these by the way are things that you would express in the type system, like the different partial orders that you use uh, for your for your data flows. Nice. Uh, can you can you show the Rust code the uh, the yes. code that you? So was it in like pure Rust or uh, was it in like? Uh, this is so pure Rust. Yeah. Uh, maybe at, at some points we've omitted some types. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, basically this is like the, the it's a library for for Rust. Yeah. So uh, what's the library name I couldn't note now? A differential data flow. So yeah. you have the GitHub link. So here. the there is a GitHub org because 
differential data flow again built some timely data flow, mm -hmm. which was uh, originally developed as Nayad at Microsoft Research mm -hmm. and over and be, uh, was ported to Rust mm -hmm. and differential data flow builds on top of that. Mm -hmm. And there's also, this is all Rust, so mm -hmm. this, this gives you the workhorse mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. and uh, then we also build declarative mm -hmm. differential data flows on top of that or 3DF. And this allows us, it's kind of like materialized views over streams. So you can just uh, register a query and you will get notified as soon as that changes and you can do it dynamically. But because normally when you're in a data flow setting, you have to define computations beforehand and they just continue running. And in this case, you can do that dynamically. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. This allows you cool, cool stuff like easily creating front-end applications, analytics dashboards, permissioning, that kind of stuff. That is something, the permissioning is something where like people that are using GraphQL in the front end right now, one of the, the initial questions that everyone has is like, if I give my client the ability to arbitrary query my, my backend data, how do I ensure that they are not violating any visibility guarantees? And uh, something like this, this turning it the other way around and building kind of like incrementalized caches automatically through these queries allows us to express like even complex uh, role-based, property-based, uh, access control schemes, for example, as data log that get converted automatically into these incrementalized data flows, and uh, we can ensure that way that the data that goes out like adheres to all of these uh, to all of these constraints. All right. All right. Any more Thank questions? you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>